this is uh, the last sermon that I'll do for a period of time at least uh, at MCC Boston. And I want to begin by acknowledging my deep gratitude to you, uh, MCC Boston, for the two and almost two and a half years that I've been here. You know, I had the privilege of being associated with your church early on in the 1980s when I first became an MCC minister. When I was a minister at MCC in New York City, we would uh, have, we had what we called the Northeast District. There were probably 20 churches all together at that time, MCC churches. And when we came to MCC Boston for our occasional meetings, that was like coming to the Vatican of Radical. Uh, that, was the, that was the legacy, the reputation the, uh, of MCC Boston. Unafraid, bold, uh, in every single way. Queer before queer was used as an emblematic word uh, to mean liberation. That was MCC Boston. And I have pictures of me preaching here, you know, much thinner and with hair, uh, red hair, actually, uh, in the 1980s, early 1980s. And, uh, and it was an important church then to me. And then uh, my friend Steve Carson was the pastor here for several years in the uh, mid, late 80s. Uh, and had occasion to be here. And then when I was a student on sabbatical at Harvard Divinity School in the mid 90s, again, I was able to be here um, during the time that I was in Cambridge. And then uh, again, these last two years that I've been working in Needham uh, as, the, as the interim pastor at the Congregational Church there. Here's been the continuous thread that I want to appreciate about you and want to make sure it doesn't go unsaid. You have always been a queer sanctuary, a place where you can be yourself, whatever your weird self is, <laughs> uh, where you can uh, explore your faith, question, be critical, uh, be involved, be engaged. This is the great experiment, MCC Boston. And I think it lends credibility, not only to MCC, but to the whole Christian enterprise. A spiritual community, really, more often than not, that has, con that has continued without a paid minister, uh, where the leadership is invested in the congregation, where it's a continuous witness for liberation principles, whatever that means in whatever time that you find it in. Uh, and that's the gift of MCC Blossom. It's a precious flame that gets passed to the people who need it at a time when the world needs it to be whatever it is most. And I just wanted to thank you. I could not have been doing what for me was pioneering work by being a openly gay, formerly MCC minister, working at a rather traditional New England Congregational Church in the suburb uh, of Boston, if I hadn't had MCC Boston to come to on Sunday nights. Uh, it was new for me and new for them to have an openly gay minister in the way that I'm gay. Um, and we did important, incredible work in Needham during our time. But I didn't even know how much God provided for me by providing this church. So I started coming here again on Sunday nights, even though I was tired from working all day Sunday. I was able to do what I have done because of this place and because of the people. And if you get nothing else from tonight's sermon, I want you to get this about the gift of MCC Boston. Everybody deserves a community where they can be themselves. That's the most important thing. And how church ever went off the rails to become the last place people can be themselves, I don't know, because I'm sure it's not what Jesus intended. But this is what Jesus intended. A place where you can just come and be, where you don't have to put on airs, where you don't have to pull yourself together. You can come and be exactly how you are and on a spectrum of uh, pulled together or not uh, and experience God's love in Jesus Christ in the open communion table. This is what has sustained me. So I just wanted to thank you for that. Tonight, um, I'm gonna to try and tie together three things if I can. Uh, the Bible story, briefly. Also, the 500th, plus a few years, anniversary of the Protestant Reformation, uh, because I think we stand in a lineage with it in MCC. And then the 50th anniversary of our MCC movement. This is the last sermon, sermon uh, in the series that we've been doing on Sunday nights in October, celebrating 50 years of metropolitan community churches in all their manifestations around the world uh, and throughout the years. It has changed, it is different, once known as the gay church, once described, um, and that was a term of derision, by the way, 
uh, when people called, oh, that's the gay church, people would say about us. And we claimed it back and said, yeah, we are the gay church. We're the fabulous church. And we're proud to be that. Uh, but uh, it had been started out that way. In the early years, people talked about it as a transitional church. We'll just be around as long as it takes for the mainline churches to welcome us. And then we'll go out of business gracefully. And I think there was something true and untrue about that. Uh, it was a way for us to say we had no intention to build an institution. And also it was a way for us to say we really do believe we will have an effect that someday Christianity will welcome LGBTQ people the way we know Jesus would have with open arms 2,000 years ago. And I think that's both true and not true today uh, in some ways. You know, coming back to Boston now after all these years and working here where there's a darn UCC church and I'm part of the UCC now, I'm proud of it, but with a rainbow flag on it on every corner, it wasn't like that 50 years ago. We have had an effect and it is not like that everywhere in this country or everywhere in this world. Before I worked here, uh, I spent two years in Denver and before that, two years in Dallas at the Cathedral of Hope uh, Church that was both MCC and then became UCC. I'll tell you in the South, it is too soon to achieve, to say we have achieved the revolution. Uh, it's too soon to say that, uh, even though we have made remarkable progress. So I do want to, um, acknowledge this 50 years of MCC and whenever we look at history it should always be with an eye toward not just what happened then but what does it say to us now what's happening now how does it inform our faith now how does it inform who we are and all of this I want to say on a night a day after a difficult week in which we saw in Kentucky two African-American elderly people killed and slaughtered in a Kroger's uh, just because they were black by a white racist guy. And that's a story that almost got eclipsed by everything else that took place. Um, the gunman went first to a black Baptist church and the doors were locked and couldn't get in. So then he went to the Kroger and uh, achieved his evil deed there. And then the pipe bombs that have reminded us of the incivility of our national discourse when democratic leaders were targeted. And then most heinous, and it's not a competition, I don't mean to say most heinous, but shockingly heinous, the attack yesterday at Tree of Life Synagogue. This is also a background to, not a background, it's the foreground to who we are. Right now, this is our world, and what kind of spiritual community does it need? What is the gospel calling us to be? You know, the, the killing of 11 people at the Tree of Life Synagogue. I just want to say this very plainly. We understand that here um, in some very intimate ways. There have been many, it's now common almost, or accepted that we can do a recitation of the First Baptist Church in Sutherland, Texas of the uh, Mother Emanuel AME Church in Charleston. Uh, uh, and for us, I think particularly as LGBTQ people and our allies and friends, the shootings at the Pulse nightclub in Orlando was like a church shooting. It was a violation of our sanctuary, our safe place. So this, uh, these kinds of shootings have become commonplace and I do think it's calling us to something as MCC people and as people of faith, regardless of where we live that out, these times are unprecedented. Even though people in the past have experienced suffering too, this is a wake up time when in just a few days, people in Massachusetts will be going to the polls to decide whether or not to rescind already enacted civil rights protection for transgender people. If ever we needed a wake up call to say, oh, your work is not done, your work has never been more vital, it's Proposition 3, uh, particularly for us in MCC, because the opposition to transgender rights, the group sponsoring the referendum, Renew Massachusetts, you can go to their website, is a group that is Christian based, it's a religious group, 
And they have two goals. One is to rescind these uh, transgender rights. The other, and it's clearly stated on their website, is to make sure that Massachusetts does not become a sanctuary state. A clear linking of xenophobia, homophobia, transphobia, everything that's wrong right now. Everything that the gospel calls us to make a difference about. So that's a lot I want to try together, try together but I'm going to try it. Let's see if it works. In the gospel today, we have Jesus modeling what it means to be both the changer and the changed. What it means to be a change maker in the world and to be so open that he sees things differently, models a different response, and inspires others to participate. If ever there was a template for us at MCC, it's kind of what we see here in Mark's gospel, where in this version of the Jesus story, in Mark's version, um, it has uh, Jesus coming to Jericho, lots of people are around, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, sitting by the roadside. I want to say this clearly, whenever we use a story from the Bible that depicts a differently abled person, it is not meant, uh, it cannot be for us at least, seen as a judgment, a punishment from God, or as somehow less or demeaning or trivializing. This person navigates the world differently, but not less and still has a desire to navigate the world this way that the, he knows other people do. Um, so, but definitely a person who is seen dismissively in first century eyes. And up until now in Mark's gospel, whenever people, whenever a voice recognizes Jesus, it's a demon, and that's a weird word to use in the 21st century, but uh, someone who is meant to epitomize evil or or wrongdoing or something off. But this is the first voice to call out to Jesus with a name and a recognition in this version of the Jesus story that is a person who epitomizes good. Evil recognizes good sometimes more readily than good recognizes good. In this story, the hero is Bartimaeus, the one who is not able to see, but who is able to see something that the people who are closest to Jesus, who just previously in the story were arguing about who gets the corner office, you know, who's, who's the one that's going to uh, be highest in esteem. Uh, they don't see it, but uh, Bartimaeus, who was unable to see visually or physically, does say, Jesus, in the lineage of all that's royal and holy in our holy tradition, have mercy on me. That means identify with me. Take on my situation. Experience the world the way I'm experiencing it. Don't judge me. Be like me. Be with me. Be with me. And the people are, of course, not interested sternly ordering him. I think that's sternly ordering him to be quiet. But when you've got a testimony to make, and you know it's what God has given you to say, People sternly ordering you to be quiet are just an invitation to speak louder and louder. That's the MCC gift. If you want to see MCC in the first century text, it's the people who, when they tell you to shut up, speak even more loudly than before. And so he keeps calling to Jesus, and Jesus is engaged. He hears something. He sees something. He's changed by this encounter. This is what makes Jesus a role model for us in the MCC movement. Not someone who is static, but someone who is willing to be changed by the circumstances of the change he's involved in bringing about in the world. Jesus hears him and says, Take, bring it to me. I want to hear what this guy's talking about. And uh, Jesus says to him, so what, what, is it that, what is it that you want from me? You know, people are not interested in hearing you. They're not listening. They're not seeing you. And he says, all I want is to be able to experience what you experience too. I, I want that same capacity, that same advantage, that same social location. Make your world and my world one world. That's what he says. But he says, I want to see. And Jesus perceives about him that this one who no one else values sees something that's vital for his, for their, for all of our liberation. And that's when Jesus says these words, your faith 
has made you well. Those words Jesus spoke to him, Jesus speaks also to us. Our faith is what has sustained us throughout all these years. It is, it's an amazing gift, and faith is a gift, I think. And some of us have it more than others, or struggle more strongly than others. We can take turns holding it when some have lost faith. But Jesus says to him, your faith has made you well, by which he means your faith is making me a better person too. And together we can make the world a better place. That's the first Reformation story uh, that I want to address. Reformation, change, revolution, transformation, redecorating, however you want to look at it. Reformation, the, the understanding that when spirit moves, we don't cling to the past, but it becomes a springboard for us to do something new. And the enemy of faith, if you will, or the death of faith, is when we try to freeze frame it, or contain it, or domesticate it. But all that reformation is, is just what we see here when Jesus says to someone that no one else values, oh my God, you understand spirituality better than anybody. And I want to be like you. You want to be like me? I want to be like you, Jesus is saying to Bartimaeus. That's what Reformation is. Today we celebrate in Christian churches around the country Reformation Day. Uh, our, our recalling and honoring of the place that Martin Luther has had in our Protestant Christian tradition. And I want to acknowledge it too, particularly because of what happened yesterday, and I'll say why in a moment. But Martin Luther does model in some ways, imperfect person that he is, the spirit that is behind all social change, all spiritual change, including MCC. We are a Reformation church. Uh, in 1517, Martin Luther, a Catholic monk, is critical of the uh, way that church is being played out by the corruption that he sees in a widespread way. You can study more the particulars about this, um, the fact that he was making this critique at just the right moment in history when the printing press had been somewhat recently invented meant that his ideas could be heard uh, more broadly. They weren't necessarily original, but it was the right moment, the right time. He took a risk and he posted um, on the church door in Wittenberg, we kind of romanticized this moment, but really that was the place where uh, in, uh, in his German university town where when people had something they want to lift up for discussion, they would post it there. So he posted 95 points that were in uh, the original, in the core, disputations against the practice of indulgences. That's pretty arcane. Um, but let's just say the church was engaged in questionable fundraising techniques. And he was willing to call it out. And in addition to that, sometimes, you know, when you pull out a thread, it didn't start there, but eventually, the things that he raised about how church is, its relationship to government, um, led to changes that we benefit from today that are standard practice in Protestant Christianity. We worship in a language of our own. We don't worship in a language we don't understand. We're encouraged to have our own Bibles and not to trust the priest or the church to tell us what's in the Bible. Every person, their own spiritual authority. That was what Martin Luther stood for. Um, the introduction of congregational singing uh, into what worship was like really changed it in a way that we as Protestant Christians especially enjoy. So many things by his willingness to question at the right time, just like today with the internet, uh, is the right time to achieve change. Um, he was hashtag Reformation Day on October 31st. 1517. And so we celebrate that moment, but more importantly, we celebrate his response when he was brought to trial four years later um, and given the chance to recant. He said, I cannot and will not recant, for to go against conscience is neither right nor safe. Here I stand, I can do no other. So help me, God. And I love that. I, I can't go against my conscience, he says. It's neither right nor safe. And that's what spirituality does for us. It empowers us to take unpopular stances, to innovate, to question authority, to be critical of structures and systems. 
and uh, not to back down in the face of opposition. So uh, he was found to be a heretic uh, at, that, um, uh, at that trial of the Diet of Worms, it was called, 1521. And anyone who aided or abetted him or provided shelter with him was also considered to be a heretic, heretic and subject to uh, prosecution from the state. He ended up uh, being incarcerated for some time. Uh, but even just note that little thing. Not only was he found guilty of questioning authority, but they also said anyone who supports him is also guilty. This is how oppressive systems maintain their hold on oppressed people. But when we band together, those holds cannot be maintained. So we celebrate that about Martin Luther, a model of reformation, of revolution. But here's what I have to say. If I'm gonna mention Martin Luther in church today, I also have to acknowledge that he was a mixed bag at best, and that he reflected many of the prejudices of his own era and time. And in particular, I wanna say this, he was a terrible anti-Semite. He was obsessed with Jews and Judaism, as many religious thinkers were at the time, but we don't lift them up as heroes in the same way. This does not diminish that he had something valuable to say and made a positive contribution. But on a day after the worst attack on Jewish Americans in our history, in the United States history, where 11 were killed in one place, we can't say that Martin Luther gets a pass on anti-Semitism and neither do we. Here's what Martin Luther said. I'm just gonna give you one little example of his later works. There was no other explanation for this other than the one cited from Moses. Namely, that God has struck the Jews with madness and blindness and confusion of mind. So we are even at fault, we are even at fault, in not avenging all this innocent blood of our Lord and of the Christians which they had shed for 300 years after the destruction of Jerusalem, and the blood of the children they have shed since then, which still shines forth from their eyes and their skin, we are at fault in not slaying them. Those are harsh, ugly words. And it's impossible for a church like an MCC church to gather on this important religious holiday, Reformation Day, where we still can say, okay, Martin Luther did some good things. This is wrong, and it's particularly wrong because it had a deep influence on religious intellectual thought. And I don't want to just say Lutherans, I want to say Christians, and I want to say Catholics and Protestants together. Our faith has permeated with anti-Semitism, conscious and unconscious, sometimes visible, sometimes less visible. And we gather in our churches on Good Friday, and we talk about the Jews, the Jews, the Jews, because we're reading an ancient text. We can't just say that that has nothing to do with how we justify the rightness of our own faith today. Here's what I know. In Needham, where I work this morning, one of my friends, Jennifer, said that her children were afraid to go to Hebrew school this morning. As <laughs> 10 year olds, afraid to go to Hebrew school because they knew what happened yesterday. And Christianity, our Christian religion, is an important supporter of anti-Semitism. We, our reformation today has got to be to find a way to first consciously repent of anti-Semitism that we participate in and also change our faith so that we don't justify Christianity on the basis of a failed Judaism or something. It's deep in us. It's so deep in us we don't even see it. But we know it because, I will say this, when we go to have events in my church in Needham, which is known to be the safe place, the welcoming place, when we had our big transgender rally last Monday, some of our Jewish friends said, I don't feel comfortable going in a Christian church. We need to hear that and be willing in the spirit of reformation to say, whatever it takes, I don't want my faith to promote anti-Jewish bias in any way, and I don't want it myself. And I don't want it in the world. We can do that. We need to assure our Jewish friends now more than ever. We noticed what happened yesterday. And we are paying attention. And we'll do what we can to change it. 
And that brings us to our 50th anniversary of MCC, our Metropolitan Community Church Movement, our LGBT churches, the gay church, as they called it, and they wanted to make fun of us. What does it mean for us to be in this tradition of reformation, of change, of evolving? What does it mean today? You know, our numbers are numerically much smaller than they ever were. When I used to preach here in the 80s, there were 100 people here. And this is just one. There are far few churches. One reason is LGBT people have found themselves a place in the mainline churches that we never thought that would happen. We could take some credit for that. Another reason is people aren't going to church so much anymore because they're seeing the emptiness of the gap between what Christianity says it believes and what it stands for in the world. And we could take that on and say, well, we want to make it different. 50 years ago, gay people gathered in homes and in bars because they couldn't meet in churches. My own church in San Francisco, where I pastored for 15 years, met in a bar for the first two years. And that was not an unusual MCC story. We met and self-determined our own spiritual destiny, even when others condemned it and would not recognize it. This is what reformation is. This is what being changer and changed is. And we still have to keep doing it. I was thinking about, and this is a classic gym move, but you know, you'll appreciate it, I hope. Um, as something that you won't have to do when no, I'm no longer going to be here. <laughs> that the origin of our churches was in protest movements. MCC was activist, visible, on the streets. Two, four, six, eight, gay is just as good as straight. Can you say that? Two, four, six, eight, gay is just as good as straight. Three, five, seven, nine, lesbians are mighty fine. Three, five, seven, nine, lesbians are mighty fine. Gay, straight, black, white, same struggle, same fight. Gay, straight, black, white, same struggle, same fight. Now, I don't want to uh, overlook the naivete of that, that as social analysis, but it was an attempt in those early days. When you gathered in an MCC church, you might sing Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine, oh, what a foretaste of glory divine, or you might just as well be on your way to a protest march where you would say those chants. And it meant something about our origin, about our, how are we different from other churches because we want to change the world and we expect to have a place in changing it. We want to be like blind Bartimaeus, the annoying people that keep bringing it up. My body, my choice. My body, my choice. My body, my choice. My body, my choice. We joined our liberation struggle with other liberation struggles, with the fight for women's rights. We still have never passed an equal rights amendment in the United States. Think about that. A simple amendment to the Constitution that never was able to be voted on because it failed to get passage in the Congress. Men and women are equal. We joined our struggle with that. We joined our struggle with civil rights movements that continue into the present. No justice, no peace. No justice, no peace. No justice, no peace. Because we know how important it is to say clearly and plainly Black Lives Matter as part of our faith commitment. That's what it means to be MCC. No hate, no fear. Immigrants are welcome here. No hate. No fear, immigrants are welcome here. No hate, no fear, immigrants are welcome here. That's what it means to be MCC today, to be aware of who is standing in the place that we once inhabited and where some like us still inhabit, and to say we are looking for others and we are joining together in a big movement. And we're not just saying, Jesus, mercy, Jesus, have mercy on me. We are saying, world, pay attention. We're not putting up with it anymore, and we are going to change it, and we are going to change it for everyone who lives on a margin. So here's my pitch, MCC Boston, as we celebrate the Protestant Reformation, 500 years, I say we can do better. We can take it further. And as we celebrate 50 years of the MCC church movement, MCC Boston, you're not done. 
I expect to hear great things about how the world is different as a result about your continued witness at 131 Cambridge. And finally, I want to say thank you, thank you, thank you for modeling for me something that I will take with me wherever I go, a community that embraces change and reformation and revolution as part of our spiritual practice. Amen. Amen. Amen.